Thank you, Paul, for the, the very nice introduction. It, it's always an honor and a pleasure to have the opportunity to, to present at the Academy. Uh, you know, I, I don't think there's too many people in the whole meeting, much less in the hall here, that, that would uh, uh, take exception to the fact that, that probably today implants and periodontal plastic surgery are the strongest growth area in, in, our, in our practice. We're fortunate that in periodontics, we really have uh, the leaders in tissue engineering in all of dentistry. And uh, uh, the organizing committee has asked that, that I share with you uh, some of our clinical research focused on tissue engineered uh, solutions for aesthetic dilemmas. And, and I'm, of course, happy to do so. That, this is really our passion in our clinical research uh, is uh, uh, tissue engineering related to soft tissue defects. And I'm going to share with you a number of studies that, that we've published, but just very briefly, primarily as background material, how things have evolved, and then spend most of our time this morning talking about three studies that we've completed but have yet to, to publish. Now, when it comes to uh, tissue engineering, if I can get my, there we go, soft tissue engineering, our objectives are to, in certain instances, increase keratinized tissue, Augment papilla, you know, that's something we've not been able to do with traditional periodontal plastic surgery, so we're all looking for uh, options to allow us to, to do that. Uh, we're looking for ways to improve our abilities to cover denuded root surfaces. Stimulate wound healing, that, that's an interesting thing because that's something we haven't been able to do. It's something really I haven't even thought about until the last five years or so. What happens if we can place an agent in that, that stimulates wound healing? And then, of course, the, the holy grail regeneration not just repair, but, but achieving regeneration. And I'll share with you this morning studies in which we've been able to accomplish each one of these objectives using tissue engineering. And we also want to be able to do this, clicker here is having a problem, with uh, out of donor site. We want to do it with reduced morbidity and increased predictability for our patients. We want to have more robust results a more natural outcome. That's a, another kind of theme that we're going to be talking about. You know, with today's surgical guidelines, we can pretty much predict what we can do and what we can't do. I think the next level is to be able to take it such that, that our outcome is indistinguishable from what Mother Nature really expected there to be there. Uh, and, and then we want to do it with an unlimited amount of donor material. A lot of times today we are, are having to limit the amount of treatment based on the fact we just have to treat the worst sites because uh, we have a, a limited amount of donor material. And then finally with less technique sensitivity. This uh, last one, less technique sensitivity, is also an interesting one. You know, what, what, what makes the difference between a master clinician and an average clinician? Well, a lot of things go into it, maybe uh, the way uh, flap design, your, your incisions, the way you, you manage the soft tissues, your suture techniques. Well, what if I have a tissue engineered construct that I can slip underneath the flap before I suture it that stimulates wound healing? That could compensate for a lot of those small inadequacies and move average clinicians into master clinicians and really level the playing field. And I think that's another area that we will see tissue engineering really altering the landscape of, of periodontal plastic surgery and all of our surgical procedures. I'm absolutely convinced that in the future, you and I will not be performing any passive surgeries. All of our surgeries will have an active component to it and it will be tissue engineering that will provide those active components. Now, I've been asked to uh, uh, disclose, uh, as all uh, presenters are, that uh, they, most of my research has been funded by different companies. They're listed here on the, the board. But I always maintain complete control of reporting of all of the data. Now, when it comes to tissue engineering, it's, I think of it as a matrix or a spectrum. And on one end of the tissue engineering spectrum, we have the live cells. On the other end, we have the bio bioactive molecules. And we're going to begin by talking about the live cell end of the tissue engineering matrix, studies that we've done by implanting living cells into the host to try to stimulate activities that we're interested in. Now, as you begin to think about soft tissue engineering, there's two basic lines of research that you kind of start bumping into biologically based devices and live cell based devices and they're very very different and you almost have to start having a different kind of mindset as far as expectations from these type of graphs 
Now, when it comes to biologically based devices, the ones, the, the, the most common one that we're all uh, uh, familiar with is a cellular dermal matrix. You know, it, 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 it is basically an immunologically inert uh, allograft. It's capable of, of uh, fibroblast migration, revascularization. But the bottom line is this is a dead piece of tissue, and it brings nothing else to the party. It's just a tissue replacement graft, nothing else. That's very different than live cell-based devices. Live cell-based devices are much more than a tissue replacement graft. Think of them as, as a little factory that they're bringing in all sorts of things. They're bringing in cells, they're bringing in cytokines, they're bringing in uh, glycaminoglycans, collagens, all sorts of things that are going to stimulate angiogenesis, are going to stimulate pathways toward regeneration, and in my mind, most importantly, they're going to deliver it on demand. Now, think about some of the biologic mediators that we've known about for a long time. Let's, let's pick BMP, for example. You know, we, we know that's a strong bone-stimulating protein. We place it into the defect, and we stand back, and we wait for magic to happen. Sometimes magic happens, but oftentimes magic doesn't happen. What's the problem here? And I don't mean just with BMP. I mean with any mediator. Well, how do we know that it really got to where we want it to be? How do we know when it got there, it stayed there long enough? What do we know about the concentration? Did we have too much? Was there not enough? Was it still viable? All of those variables are very difficult to control. Yet with these live cell-based devices, these cells are talking to each other, and they're talking to the native cells in the defect. And they then theoretically can physiologically titrate the amount of these biologic mediators necessary in order to kick off the regenerative cascades to do all the things we're wanting to do. So this is a, a very different system than what we've been thinking of in the past. Now the first live cell based device that we did research on was the living human fibroblast drive dermal substitute. This is uh, it at about four or five days. You're seeing human fibroblasts lying in parallel with collagen. These fibroblasts come from neonatal foreskins. They, uh, it, it's, a, it's a very neat little way to, for a donor, size, a donor source, these single cell or single donor cell lines have a lot of, of nice things about it. You know, if you're using cadaveric tissue, uh, even though you're going to test, 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 there is a limit of how much testing you can do if you're having to do this on multiple cadavers. But on single, single donor cell lines, it gives you great uniformity, great availability of the cells, and extraordinarily uh, ability to test these things. Now, fibroblasts do not elicit an immune response, so that we don't have to worry about. And these fibroblasts are grown in this particular system on vicral sheets. This is uh, an SEM of this material at about five days. These are the vicral fibers, and you're seeing the fibroblasts stretching across. And so we place this material into the defect. As you know, the vicral's lost through hydrolysis. It leaves behind not only the fibroblasts, but the collagens, the glycaminoglycans, all of these things. Think of it like a little factory. So we're, we're placing this metabolically active graft in the defect, and then it's stimulating wound healing, regeneration, all of the type of things that, that we're wanting to do here. Also, my computer is lower than me. Also, uh, uh, it stimulates angiogenesis. Here is just the vicro material itself, and here is the test material at three days, and look at the spontaneous blood vessel growth here. Now again, think of all of our surgical guidelines. You know the things that tell you and I what we can and can't do? What are all of our surgical guidelines based upon? Primarily blood supply issues. Well, what if we can go in and grow our own blood vessels? You know, it has the potential to change the way that, that we practice. This particular material is, is cryopreserved. This is a little bioreactor that it's grown in and is cryopreserved. And through a rapid thaw, thaw you can bring it back to life. Yeah, life. I mean, this is uh, kind of science fiction kind of stuff. And pivotal studies show that when you bring it back, it's still producing the glycaminoglycans, the cytokines, all of those kinds of things in therapeutic range. This is what it looks like after it has been thawed. Uh, and we're in the process of cutting out a little piece here that I'm going to use um, uh, on a, a free autogenous graft. 
It has kind of a hard uh, uh, plastic on either side and then the, the cells and all of the uh, other uh, uh, proteins and everything are uh, on this uh, little piece of Vicryl. I've obviously already created the bed and I've just placed it in there. And it just lays right down in there very nicely. You go in and you suture it uh, in approximately. And in this particular study, this is a, it was a 12-month study where we're just trying to, to generate keratinized tissue. And you can see here with the test site, I've stained it with, with Schiller's iodine stain just to differentiate the mucosa from the keratinized tissue. And our control was a free gingival graft. We also did a small pilot study where we used this for root coverage. Here you can see fairly broad, deep uh, uh, recession defects. I uh, biomodified the root surfaces, went in and, and created a, a typical partial thickness flap, did our interoperative measurements, and we cut a little piece of the material out of the bioreactor the size that we need. You just kind of open the bioreactor, you take the, the uh, cells out, and you can see I'm just placing it on the bed here. I'll suture it in approximately, currently advance the uh, uh, tissue up over it. And here at one year, we see very nice root coverage, no visible signs of inflammation. There's, there's virtually no probing depth here. And I don't want to spend any time, more time on this because you can go and you can read about both of these studies we published in 2005 in the Journal of Periodontology. I present this more as, as just foundation for the next generation material, which is a, a material that we're doing a number of uh, uh, projects on right now. This is one in which we, it was a pilot study that we were uh, going in and trying to generate keratinized tissue. Our test, is, I mean our control is a free gingival graft. This study is, is, is complete. It will be in your next, uh, it'll be in the October issue of the Journal of Periodontology. I have the page proofs with me that I'll look at on the plane back and, and you should have it on your desk hopefully in another month. It's already available online. And uh, one of the neat things that Ken Cornman's doing with the uh, Journal of Periodontology is now on the online issues, uh, some of them have videos. And this particular uh, uh, paper is available not only online, but there's a video that goes with it. So it's kind of cool. Uh, he's doing a lot of neat things with our journal. And so with this particular uh, study, uh, we're looking at a 25 patient pilot study. Uh, we want at least two non-adjacent teeth and contralateral quadrants uh, with insufficient attached gingiva. And it's not a root coverage kind of study. Uh, basically, exclusion criteria are the normal things, but we didn't allow smokers. Now, if you look at the material that we're dealing with here, it's very different than the one I showed you a minute ago. You know, the one I showed you a minute ago was just the dermis, right? Where this has a, a well-differentiated dermis, it has an epidermis, and, and we've got a stratum corneum, we've got these living keratinocytes here, the living dermal fibroblasts, and then of course the fibroblasts are producing all sorts of extracellular matrix. Both the keratinocytes and the fibroblasts, like the last material, come from neonatal foreskin, so they're, they're about as close as you can get to stem cells. They're, they're very robust, young, young, vibrant cells. And the material was originally made as a skin replacement graft. And you know, if you're, if you're trying to create skin, it makes sense to make it look like skin. So here is uh, just a, a, a piece of skin here that you're looking at histologically, and here is the, the, the test material. And you can see that it very much resembles skin. It doesn't, though, have Langerhorn cells, melanocytes, lymphocytes, endothelial cells, red blood vessel cells. It also doesn't have sweat uh, uh, glands, hair follicles, other things you might not want in the oral environment. But what, is, what we've found and what others have found over the, the years in, in research with this, and this has been year, used for, for a long time for uh, diabetic ulcers, been over two, uh, uh, I can't remember, uh, I think 200,000 applications of, of this material. So uh, it has a high safety profile. It's just not been used for these applications in the oral environment. And, and what they've found is, is that the important thing is not its anatomical uh, kind of relationship of how it looks like skin. The most important thing is that it, when you have the keratinocytes and the fibroblasts together, they're more robust. There's lots of crosstalk between these fibroblasts and the keratinocytes, and they're synergistic. And when they're together, they're producing a lot more cytokines than they are when they're separate. You can look at the, the cytokine production when you have just keratinocytes and the cytokine production when you just have fibroblasts. But when they are placed together, you have all the normal cytokine production that you see in human skin. 
Now, to me, the interesting thing, though, is that a lot of these cytokines are the ones that you and I have been, have been wanting to have access to for years. If you look at, at just some of the cytokines, uh, BMP7, this material is producing, uh, it's producing uh, PDGF, it's producing VEGF, it's also producing a lot of other ones you know, that we talk about, TGF beta 1, uh, IL-6, uh, a lot of these that we know are important to, to, in the regenerative cascade. So here we have a single material that's producing a whole a host of different cytokines. It's producing, as the, the one I showed you earlier, it's some, some important angiogenic, the, the VEGF, also the basic fibroblast uh, growth factor. It too is stimulating uh, uh, angiogenesis. They've taken in, in animals, they've infarcted the uh, heart, placed this, uh, this material on the infarct, and seen spontaneous blood vessel growth around the infarct. So again, it has the, the potential to, to really change the way that we do things. Because again, think of one of the reasons, why, why can't we predictably regenerate for patients? Why can't we predictably regenerate the pillars? Blood supply, at least that's a big part of it. What if we can grow own blood vessels in those areas? Has potential to really change things. Another interesting thing is that it, you know, if you were to cut your skin here this morning, one of the things that happens is in a, in a burst, your body produces a peptide called beta defensin. And it's an antimicrobial peptide that, that your body produces to help that little cut heal. But it only does it in, a, in an acute burst. This material produces beta defensin on an ongoing basis. And again, what's one of our challenges as, as we try to, to regenerate tissue in the oral environment? It's the, the bacterial bio burden. You know, why are we using chlorhexidine and all these kind of things? Well, here we have a material that's producing on an ongoing basis a, a, an antimicrobial. So again, interesting uh, concepts that, that may have influence on how we use this in the future. To me, though, the most exciting thing is the fact that this is a living construct that is interacting with the native environment. Here's an MRA analysis looking at certain, the production of certain cytokines, and here's the day you place the material into the defect. And if you follow the production of these cytokines, you'll see that some of them are upregulated at, at, you know, as you move on. In other words, some are being more, or more active at day four than they were when you put it on. And that's because it's talking to the host. It's finding out, what do you need? Okay, here it comes. You got enough, we'll shut it down. Very different than, than how we've acted in the past when we've attempted to stimulate regeneration. And concrete evidence that the fact that this is a living construct is the fact if you wound it, it heals. You'll see in the pilot study that, that we did wound this material to upregulate uh, the production of cytokines. They, they found that in some of the plastic surgical studies that this was, was beneficial. And you know, I naively asked uh, early on, well, why don't you just you know, uh, wound it or serrate it before you send it to us? And they said, well, because it'll, he it'll be healed by the time it gets to you. You know, it's kind of wild. So here, here is the material at zero hours after it's been cut. At uh, um, 12 hours, you're seeing the keratinocytes beginning to migrate over the surface. 24 hours, the keratinocytes have completely migrated over the surface. And by five days, completely closed, a fully differentiated epidermis. We did uh, uh, biopsies on seven of our patients to look at the type of uh, tissue we were gaining. And when we had uh, histologists that were blinded to what they were looking at, they couldn't tell any difference. Uh, just normal, this is the test material, normal looking uh, uh, dermis with uh, uh, normal epidermis here, keratinized uh, tissue, and this is the, the free gingival graft. Also, you know, we're taking uh, chromosomal material from one individual, placing it in another, and we want the, these cells to come in, they do their job and leave. So we also did persistence studies, and uh, there was no evidence of persistence uh, on any of the individuals that we've tested. And again, this is something that's gone through extensive testing on study after study after study. We also chose to use this material in three layers. And so we did a Z-fold. Now, originally, you might think that, oh, well, you did this Z-fold here because it gives you the kind of the thickness of a free gingival graft. But you've got to get away from that. And don't be thinking of this as a graft. We did this, this Z-fold here to increase the dose. We want to, to be able to deliver more cells. We want to be able to deliver more cytokines, all the things the cells are producing. And that's the reason we did the Z-fold. And uh, in this particular study, uh, uh, we did standardize the width of the uh, free gingival graft to five millimeters, the width of the uh, uh, 
test material was also five millimeters. And this is what we're trying to get rid of. We're trying to move away from having to, to put our patients through this and, and having to have a limited amount of donor material. This is how the uh, material comes. It's different than the one I showed you that's frozen. This material is never frozen. Uh, it's sent to you uh, fresh like this in this bioreactor. And uh, here I am uh, uh, going to, to serrate uh, this just to, uh, with the, the idea that we want to upregulate uh, the production of the cytokines and everything. So I'm just making a few little serrations here. The material is, is uh, lying on top of a little polycarbonate material and below that is, a, is an auger. Uh, and so I'm just separating it from the uh, polycarbonate and you'll see I'm going to fold it in this Z-fold, kind of like you're, you would fold the, the sheet on your, your bed down and back or, or the way you would fold a, a, um, a piece of paper to go in an envelope. Uh, this would be plenty of, t of tissue to uh, uh, graft the entire mouth if you chose to do so. Now we're just, again, in this pilot study, we were standardizing it to a five millimeter width, so I'm just checking that. And uh, now I'm going to separate it from the, the bioreactor. We found that it's easier to do with scissors. If you go in with the blade, the material tends to drag with the blade as you try to, to cut it. So I'm just uh, coming in and, and uh, separating it from the bioreactor. Now obviously we've already created the bed in the, on the individual. You can see the little polycarbonate there. And here is our patient. We'll take this over to the bed. And then we're just going to tack it down in approximately. And there is our graft. And then here is that same patient as we follow the patient out over time. Uh, this is the test graft on the top, the, the free gingival graft on the bottom, and at four weeks you, you are beginning to see the mucogingival junction uh, start to materialize both here and here. The tissue is maturing. You're seeing the keratinized tissue here around the, the teeth. And as we follow it out to six months, again, these final panels are stained with Schiller's iodine stain, uh, clearly differentiated mucogingival junction. It's with, the graft is withstanding muscle pull. Another patient test graft on the top, free gingival graft on the bottom, and you can see the tissue maturing out to six months. And if we look at these panels, this is, is uh, the close-up of, of what we're, we're trying to achieve. Both very nice results as far as if our goal is to go in and generate a nice functional zone of keratinized tissue. You can see here, uh, even though this is a nice free gingival graft, you see the borders of the graft. and, and that's fine, but that graft, if, even if you go in and, and plastic it, it's going to come back and look like that. And the reason it will is because these cells always will retain their phenotype. They come from the palate and they're always going to be palatal fibroblasts. Where these cells come in from the, the native cells that belong there, and so you have the, the cells that, are, that nature wants to be there, and so we have a more natural appearance. Now, on our results in this study, we looked at with the keratinized tissue, probing depth recession, clinical attachment level, inflammation, healing time, change in color and texture, resistance to muscle pull, and subject preference. And when we looked at six months to see what differences we had, these were the only parameters that there were any difference between test and control. And if we look at each one of the, the ones that had a, a difference, and we look first at keratinized tissue, the, the amount of keratinized tissue came out in favor of the free gingival graft, in favor of the control. We found that the amount of keratinized tissue generated with a free gingival graft was, was greater than the test graft, almost by double. But we found that the test graft was safe and capable of, ge of generating de novo keratinized tissue up to four millimeters without a donor site. And I think that's pretty outstanding if you can create up to four millimeters of keratinized tissue without taking any tissue from the palate. 24 out of 25 test sites demonstrated an increased amount of keratinized tissue and three quarters of the sites yielded two millimeters or wider. If we look at the parameters change in color and texture, these came out in favor of the test site. Not surprising because remember, this material is stimulating de novo regeneration of the patient's tissue. It's not functioning as a, as a tissue replacement graft. 
It's stimulating the cells to come in that really belong there. So of course it's going to look more natural. You're not going to have this patch-like look. You're going to have a more natural look of tissue that really belongs there. And then the final uh, parameter that was different is subject preference. And you can guess uh, which ones uh, you think you might rather have. Do you want to have somebody carve on your palate or would you like to have uh, somebody open a, a bioreactor and, and take the tissue out of that? Now, the, the positive uh, outcome of that particular uh, pilot study then led to a, uh, a properly powered multi-center study. Uh, we, we know that it's possible through the pilot study. Now we want to refine it more through a multi-center trial. And this is uh, one that we have finished all the surgeries on. Uh, it's, again, uh, basically the same study design as I just showed you the pilot uh, uh, in which we're going to see if we can create keratinized tissue. We're not trying to do root coverage. And the different uh, uh, centers that were involved was, was our office in Houston, Mark Nevins in, in Boston, Doctors uh, Cochran and Melling in San Antonio, and Will Giannobili and his group in Michigan. Uh, all of the, the study, all the surgeries are complete, and we'll, uh, the final, uh, uh, we'll, we'll finish data collection on these folks uh, about Christmas, uh, this coming Christmas. So uh, uh, sometime uh, early uh, or, or late winter, we should be able to, to begin looking at the data and really see uh, you know, what we're getting here. Now, it's a much larger study, a 96 patient study, four centers. A primary efficacy parameter here, we're looking to, to create keratinized tissue greater than or equal to, to two millimeters. We're looking at a number of other uh, things, the typical things you would look at in any study, color, texture, patient preference, sensitivity, pain, and all of the, the, the normal characters you'd look at in any sort of uh, a periodontal study. We uh, uh, did a few things different in this study, you know, based on lessons learned. Uh, as you see, we've got a much bigger piece of tissue here than what we were uh, showing you before. Uh, the uh, uh, video's having a hard time here. Uh, again, even we, I'm telling you, quit thinking of this as a tissue replacement graft, yet even we're thinking of this as a tissue replacement graft, you know, in the pilot study. You know, we're having a difficulty getting away from this. Uh, and so there's no reason to standardize the width. So we're placing a, a much wider uh, zone of, of uh, tissue here. And also we're gonna put a little protective, uh, uh, another layer of this material as kind of a protective covering over the graft itself. And so we've changed our, our techniques a little bit here uh, and uh, to see if we can actually improve the outcome. Let's see if I can get out of this video because it's not acting very good. Same material, yeah. We're just, uh, 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 you know, we, we learned some lessons in the pilot that we were changed on our multi-center trial. So here is, is uh, uh, one of our patients at our site. You can see no keratinized tissue here uh, uh, at uh, day zero. This is the test graft, the free genital graft at six months. We have a nice functional zone of keratinized tissue, uh, very equivalent to what you see with the, the free genital graft. Another patient uh, where we're, this is the test graft here, free genital graft here, and uh, a nice zone of keratinized tissue here, similar to what we have with the free genital graft. Another one, uh, test graft here, free genital graft here. Uh, and again, uh, you, you look here, just all mucosa, and you can really appreciate the, the nice zone of keratinized tissue we, create, we are creating here without a donor site at all. And the final case, uh, again, if you look here, just all mucosa, and here we have a, a nice zone of, of keratinized tissue, and uh, this is the, the connected, I mean, the free genital graft. If we look a little more up close, you can see, you know, the blood vessels and everything, the mucosa, just all mucosa, and, and a very normal looking zone of keratinized tissue, and we don't have that patch look that we have uh, on the same, you know, the, the same patient on the opposite side where we used our, our keratinized tissue. So hopefully uh, we will have uh, some uh, data to report to you uh, early spring and, and uh, hopefully this particular study will lead to FDA approval uh, of the material. We also have just begun another pilot study using this material. We're uh, wanting to see, okay, now we, we have proven we can generate keratinized tissue with it. Can we use this for, for other things like root coverage? So uh, we're looking at that with uh, comparing it to connected tissue. This is a, a pilot study, 26 patients, uh, six month study. And uh, uh, our, our treatment is either a Miller class one or two recession greater than three millimeters. And we're either gonna have chronally advanced flap with the test material or with connected tissue graft. 
looking at uh, primary uh, study objectives, uh, uh, basically just, just safety and trying to collect the information that will allow us to move into a properly powered uh, uh, pivotal study in the future. Looking at, at a lot of different composite measurements, uh, I think that you'll find in the future more and more of our studies based on aesthetics are going to be using composite endpoints, and, and I'll get into that in a moment uh, uh, as we move into another study why I think that this is going to be more important. Uh, this is one of the, the cases of where a uh, fairly deep, wide area of recession. We're placing the material in this, and this, we're using just two layers of the material rather than three for uh, the root coverage. And here I've sutured it down, currently advanced uh, the flap, and I'm going to leave you as a cliffhanger here. You'll just have to tune in uh, as we go next year to find out what our results are. Now, as we move on with our live cell end of the tissue engineering spectrum, one of the areas that, that you and I have not been able to manage is, is to regenerate uh, to papillas uh, using traditional periodontal plastic surgery. So we published a paper in 2007 using uh, Tolgia cells in an attempt to do this. We go in, we uh, harvest a little piece of tissue from the palate, we uh, send the tissue to a laboratory, the, uh, they, they go in, they separate the cells, create a cell line of, of the patient's own autologous fibroblast. These cells are expanded out to a concentration of about 200 million cells per ml, placed in an injectable medium, and we're going in and we're injecting this into the papilla with the idea that we're going to expand the papilla. Now, it's not a, this, this is not a filler, so we're not, it's not like we're injecting uh, collagen or something like this. We're injecting living cells. And because these are living cells, the, uh, theoretically they have the potential not only to maintain the result, but to perhaps improve it even over time. Now, we, we're learning a lot about gingival fibroblasts as we do all of these studies. You know, I used to think of them as mundane cells sitting around and produce collagen, and that's about all they do. But as we talked about a moment ago in the other studies, you know, these, these uh, fibroblasts are producing all sorts of cytokines. They're important for cell proliferation, extracellular matrix production, cytokine production. And it's very interesting that, that gingival fibroblasts have a great deal of phenotypic heterogeneity. That if you, if you can stimulate these, these fibroblasts into the direction you want them to go, you can actually create uh, bone with this, all sorts of different cells with fibroblasts. You can get more undifferentiated mesenchymal cells from gingival tissue than you can any other tissue in the body. And so again, theoretically, there, you could actually create regeneration with fibroblasts. So here we have the magic potion, but what makes me think we're going to be able to inject this in a papilla? Most of you in the audience have injected uh, local anesthetic in papilla. You know you can't inject any sort of volume of that into the papilla. Why would we think we can do that? Well, of course, we can't. Now, this material was, was originally tested for facial wrinkles, you know, to plump that out. Now, obviously, you could expand, you know, the, the, the tissue on the face. So this was something that we knew we'd have to, to resolve, so we created what we call the papilla priming procedure. It's just a controlled surgical insult where we go in and, and do a minor little surgical incision into the papilla, basically to do two things, to cause the papilla to swell and to kick off the body's own uh, uh, healing cascade because we're gonna try to leverage what the body does itself as it heals a wound. So here is the, the little the papilla priming procedure. You can see the tissue swollen in three days. It's remaining swollen in seven days, and by 21 days, it's completely back down. Well, how can we leverage this to our, uh, uh, you know, for, for what we want to achieve here? So here is, we're injecting the, the cells here. You, if you watch the, the, the tissue, you'll see it blanch. Either, we're either injecting 20 million cells per ml or, or placebo here in our study. Uh, what we found was we could get about 6 to 8 million cells into one papilla. And if you'll note on my timeline, we did our first injection in about 5 to 7 days after papilla priming. We chose that on purpose because if you remember back to wound healing, at about, at about five to seven days, you're moving from the inflammatory phase of wound healing into the, you're just beginning the granulation tissue formation phase. And at about five days, the body is beginning to shut down its own natural production of fibroblasts, okay? You've cut yourself or something, the body has to heal itself, it begins to produce fibroblasts. 
the fibroblasts are producing collagen, and in about five to seven days, the body says, okay, that's enough, no more fibroblast collagen production begins to wane. So we're coming in at the tail end of where the body starts shutting down its own fibroblasts, and we're going to infuse our own fibroblasts in an effort to, to continue on this granulation tissue formation phase, and we do it in a dosing schedule. Again, something we're not used to doing in periodontics, but it's done in medicine frequently. And we're going to dose this every seven days for three different uh, injections in an effort, again, to, to get as many of these, these living fibroblasts into the tissue. The idea is these fibroblasts then take up the normal residence in the dermal tissue. They are they're producing collagen, stimulating the, normal, the, the native uh, cells to produce collagen, and it thickens the dermis, so you're getting a thicker tissue here. We uh, uh, measured our changes in lots of ways, but our, our, the best and most effective ways we found to, to watch these changes was through fairly sophisticated analysis of digital photographs. And so this panel is the day zero. This is at four months and just all the different intervals. But if I put it into a graph, I think it's a little easier to see. Now this first time point, and by the way, on the, the y-axis, uh, is the, the distance, and, and so up here is a, is a, a open interproximal space, and down here is closed interproximal space as you get to the x-axis. So this is papilla priming, and you can see after we do our little surgical insult, we, we haven't done anything but the little surgery, and you see it's swell. So you're starting to close the interproximal space just from the swelling. So this is first injection, second injection, third injection. So that's one week, two weeks, three weeks. Look what happens after the third injection. Even though we've not injected any more, look at how the interproximal space closes. Now, why would that be? Well, it's because, again, these cells are sitting there producing fiber. They're producing collagen and all of that. It's thickening the dermis. It's closing down the space, even though we haven't uh, injected any more cells, and then stabilizes, and now we're out at four months. You know, you can do anything with a computer, but I'm, this is not a, a computer altered uh, uh, thing. This is simply just a time lapse. I want you to center on this, this middle screen. Watch what happens to this open and approximal space from day zero to four months. So through this pilot study, we know that it is possible. We have done uh, Another little study to, to look at different dosing regimes to, to further refine our, uh, uh, our, our measurement techniques because that's critical in this type of study. And, and we hope that uh, with proper funding that we can move this into to multi-center trials so that we can take what is possible and, and really refine it and, and make it more predictable. And uh, if that happens, then I'll be setting up a pillow parlors next to every smile, smile, bright smile thing all across the country. Let's move then from the live cell end of the tissue engineering matrix to the biologic mediators. Now, the first one I want to talk about is, is enamel matrix derivative. And uh, when you begin to, to, to read and think about biosurgery, you'll start bumping into both of these terms, tissue engineering and biomimetics. And they're similar, but, but there, there are some useful differences between the, the two uh, uh, definitions. Tissue engineering builds on the interface between material science and biocompatibility, integrated cells, natural synthetic scaffolds, and specific signals to create new tissues. Biomimetics, on the other hand, is the science of reconstructing or mimicking natural processes or tissues with the expectation that regeneration will follow. And the best example that I know of biomimetics is what happens when we place an animal matrix derivative on the root surface. We do that in an, in an effort to mimic the natural process of tooth development with the expectation that regeneration will follow. Now, if you go back to, to kind of uh, illustrations on, on mechanism action of, of enamel matrix derivative, and we're still learning lots about this material. I mean, it's kind of an amazing material that, that uh, we continue to discover, uh, you know, really what it's doing. But in kind of a basic way, the, the way we think this works is that it causes uh, undifferentiated mesenchymal cells to migrate into the defect. They attach to the root surface. They, uh, 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 they proliferate once they get into the site. And then they differentiate into all sorts of things. Uh, and the collagen, they're producing interleukin-1 uh, uh, and, and 6 and, and TGF-beta-1, which is producing the simulated matrix production. It's preventing uh, epithelial downgrowth into the defect. All sorts of things are happening. The collagen begins to accumulate kind of at a fixed distance from the root surface, and then it goes through mineralization, and finally you get an attachment apparatus. Now, 
when we began working with this and doing our study on this, most all of the work up to this point had been done on intrabony defects. But because of our interest with soft tissue, I wanted to see what could we do to leverage this with uh, root coverage uh, for, uh, uh, for, root, uh, for root surface defects. And so again, we want to compare that to at least what is in the United States the gold standard for root coverage, and that's connective tissue. And with this is a two-part uh, paper that I'll just touch on because you can go back and, and read it to the journal in, in great detail if you're interested. Uh, it's, it was an interesting study in that we went a full 12 months rather than six months. We looked at all of these different parameters. All were, were uh, there was no difference between these parameters at, at baseline. And when we looked at it a year, only these variables were different. Now the, the study wasn't powered for equivalence, but but. What that means is these, these are the only ones that there was any statistical significant difference, which means all the rest were basically the same, whether we're using the chronally advanced flap or the nano matrix derivative, or we're using the connected tissue graph. But let's look at some of the ones that were significant. Now, if we look and see the type of defects we were treating and the surgery involved, uh, we're, we're looking, this, this study, we had big defects. And, and so broad, deep defects, this will be our, our control defect on this patient. Uh, you can see a fair amount of root surface abrasion here. This is a partial thickness flap. I'm just making some intraoperative measurements. I placed the connected tissue in here. Corelli advanced the flap. And at one year, very nice root coverage. You know, you can, this is the little Corelli advanced flap that we place over it. And it's, you know, kind of pulling down uh, over time. If, this, if the patient wasn't in the, the study, I'd come back and plasty that off to make it look even nicer. But, you know, I'll take that any day. That's a, a nice result. 100% root coverage, uh, uh, good result. Okay, same patient, opposite side. This will be our test. Mirror image lesion. And like the one I just showed you, a lot of root surface abrasion here, uh, two millimeters. Now, with the connected tissue I just showed you, you know, that's kind of like putting an inlay in an inlay prep. But what, how about this? You know, two millimeter root surface abrasion, and I'm gonna put a viscous the enamel matrix derivative there, what's going to happen with the tissue when I place it in? Is it going to collapse onto the root surface? Is that going to be a problem? Well, here we have it a year. You can see 100% root coverage, very nice aesthetic result. And if we look at the emergence profile on the tooth, you can see how the tissue is maintaining proper emergence profile. No, it didn't fall into the defect. And so a very nice result. And, and we got that with, with all of the, the patients that we treated in the, defect, in the, in the study. So that was if something I was concerned about as we moved in, but it, it ended up not being a concern. We looked at probing depth in the, in the study using Florida probe, and I put this slide in only because I think as a group, periodontists, we need to do a better job when we're talking to our general dental colleagues. That mo as I talk to people all over the place, so many people think when we place graphs, we're creating pockets. We know we're not creating pockets, but we need to better communicate that to our patient. I mean, to our, our colleagues. And, and, and so here, with some industrial strength probing with the Florida probe, you can see that uh, at all time points up to 12 months, we had less than two millimeter probing depth with all of our patients. And uh, we had uh, less probing depth with our uh, enamel matrix derivative than we did with our connective tissue graph. But uh, you know, it was all less than two millimeters anyway. Now, if we look at with the keratinized tissue, that was another interesting thing that uh, we had, uh, all the patients had at least two millimeters of keratinized tissue before they entered the study. At all time points, the connected tissue graft yielded more keratinized tissue than did the enamel matrix derivative. That wasn't surprising to me because uh, uh, most of us feel that, that, that the, the uh, connected tissue from the palate is genetically encoded to produce a keratinized surface, so I would expect more keratinized tissue. But what I didn't expect is, is look at the trend here. From six months, nine months, 12 months, we continue to get increasing amounts of keratinized tissue. So it, it kind of begs the question, what if we'd extended the study you know, to, to two years rather than one year? Would these merge at some point? But as I begin to think about that, I say, you know, maybe we don't really want that. You know, what's enough? And again, we're wanting to try to end up and have what Mother Nature intends there, not this big kind of uh, scar of, of connected tissue. So here is the, the control side. Again, very little keratinized tissue here. Uh, we make our, our uh, partial thickness flap. I place the connected tissue here, currently advance the flap, and here we have it a year. A, a very nice result as far as root coverage, a, a great big zone of keratinized tissue. And of course, that's going to be, you know, uh, that's 
probably going to be more keratinized tissue than we're going to get with the chronally advanced flap and animal matrix derivative, but my point is, do we really need that? Same patient, opposite side. Very little keratinized tissue here. We make our, our uh, partial thickness flap, place our enamel matrix derivative, and chronally advance the flap. And here we have at a year. Clearly you can see an increased zone of keratinized tissue here than what we had here. And that was a trend that we saw throughout the study on all of our patients. Now if we look at, at root coverage, we had both tested control groups demonstrate an average of 4.5 millimeters of attachment gain over 12 months. We, we achieved with our control, our connective tissue graft, about 94% root coverage, and with our chronally advanced flap with an animal matrix derivative, 95% root coverage. Now it's important when we look at percentages to have benchmarks so we know what we're comparing to. And if you look at the, the systematic reviews, the meta-analysis, most say that a Miller class one and two recession, you're going to expect about 89% root coverage with a connective tissue graft. So we're, we're bettering that with, with our 94%. How about, well, what's the difference if you're, what would just a Caroli advanced flap with nothing under it? What would you expect there? And the meta-analysis say you'd expect about 82% root coverage with that. So, so we're clearly improving over what the, the systematic reviews would say on amount root coverage. Now another uh, uh, thing that we look at for effectiveness is how often can we expect 100% root coverage? So in, in this study with connect tissue graph, 79% of the time we achieved 100% root coverage. With the chronic advanced flap and an animal matrix derivative, 90% of the time we achieved 100% root coverage. Again, both of those figures beat what you typically see in the systematic reviews. And then finally, healing pattern. Now this is something that we know that an animal matrix derivative it, 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 it has a, something that, that, that improves the process of wound healing. And, and this, this uh, lateral incisor here was randomized to receive an animal matrix derivative. This is randomized to receive connect tissue graft. And let's just look at a head-to-head -head comparison as we move out in time points. Here it is at a week. Look at the connective tissue. I like this as a clinician because it's red and it's alive. I know this is going to work. But look at the inflammation, you know, the, the contours here, the swelling. Compare that to the, the contours we have at one week here. The less swelling, less inflammation. That continues out at a month. We still have more inflammation here than we have at a month and at a year. Now again, well, what do I think about this as a clinician? You know, even though you know, we do a lot of clinical research, I make my living treating patients. And this is my hobby. And so I need this stuff to work. And, and when I look at this, you know, I'll take this as a clinician every day, 100% root coverage. But you can tell I was in there. Compare that to this. You know, I could, I could hand this slide to you and say this is a picture of health, that there's never ever been any recession here. And again, this is where I think we're wanting to move. We want to be able to go beyond just being able to, to correct these defects. We want to be able to correct it in such a way that you can't tell there was ever a problem there before. And then finally, perception of pain. And you can imagine, you know, which one you would prefer. Now, we also did, uh, in this particular uh, paper, we had a patient that had two hopeless teeth that allowed us to look at uh, the type of attachment. This lateral incisor was randomized to receive an animal matrix derivative. This was randomized to receive connective tissue graft. And so this is our control. I'm just doing a little histologic marker with a quarter round burr at the, the free gingival margin. I create a partial thickness flap. I'm making my little mark here at the original alveolar crest. And we harvest a little connective tissue. We place it over our, our denuded root, chronally advance the flap. And here's what we have at six months. Now, we don't have 100% root coverage. This is a Miller class four uh, defect. So you wouldn't expect 100% root coverage, but not bad. So we're going to remove this tooth in block. This is how it looks like and in very low power. This is our notch at the osseous crest, the original, I mean, original gingival margin. And this is the notch at the original alveolar crest. If we look at it in a little more high power, we see that our long junction epithelium ends right at the superior border of the notch at the uh, original gingival margin. We don't see any uh, junction epithelium down here, but we also don't see any regeneration. We have parallel connective tissue fibers, no new cementum. And as we go down to the base, here is our original osseous crest. We have uh, a little, this is reparative cementum, this isn't uh, regenerative cementum. But again, no evidence of regeneration here. Now let's look at what goes on with our enamel matrix derivative tooth. So 
I'm making my notch at the original gingival margin. I create a flap, and this is the notch, but it's really not at the osseous crest, because this tooth had experienced an apicoectomy in the past. There was no bone at the apex. If we look at it radiographically, we can see, as you see some with these teeth that have severe bone loss and, and uh, apicoectomy, you know, the, the bone loss just wraps completely around the apex. You know, there's a reason this is a hopeless tooth. So really, you know, this notch is right there. It's at the end of the tooth, not at the osseous crest, because there is no osseous crest. And so we, we you know, do root preparation. We're placing our enamel make extremative on the, the tooth, chronally advance the flap, and at four weeks, we've got a dehiscence and a fenestration. So, you know, no, this is not a good news. Uh, this, render, this is my histologic marker full of plaque. Uh, it renders that uh, useless. Uh, and so what we're going to have to do is we're going to come in and make all of our, uh, uh, our, our histologic slices here on the medial aspect. Now, just to remind you, there's no bone here on the, on the medial aspect. You know, the bone wrap loss wraps around, as you see here, but I'm, the histology I'm just about to show you is going to come from that medial aspect of the tooth. So we'll remove that in block, and here is the tooth and low power, and we see we have all three tissues necessary for regeneration. We've got uh, uh, some new cementum, uh, we have organizing PDL fibers, and new bone, and when I saw that, I thought, wow, this looks so much like the illustration of the mechanism of action of the enamel matrix derivative. Now, remember I said collagen forms at a fixed distance from the root surface. It mineralizes in the attachment apparatus. So you can see islands of condensing bone at a fixed distance from the root surface. And I remind you that, that you get that type of regeneration only one time in nature. And that is when the tooth is being developed. You get this, the, the bone that's growing at a fixed distance from the root surface, the attachment apparatus occurs, and then it fuses to the maxilla or the mandible. Now, all other forms of regeneration are an extension of the alveolar crest. So although we lost our histologic markers and that throws in some, you know, I can't say with absolute certainty, but I can suggest that there's something very different going on here. Same patient, same surgeon, same day, yet you can see something clearly different happening here. And I think at the very least it serves as proof of principle of the biomimetic nature of the mechanism of action of enamel matrix derivative. I also will suggest to you that, that you're probably going to see a resurgence of interest in enamel matrix derivative for two reasons. One is, this is back on the market. Two is, is because there is a new systematic review out showing something that no other systematic reviews have shown. You know, both the European Federation of Periodontology and the AAP periodically do systematic reviews. And one that was just done and was, uh, it is coming out in a supplement of the Journal of Clinical Periodontology. I don't know that it's out yet. Don't think it is. Uh, authored by Cairo, and it's, it's a tr uh, systematic review, treatment of gingival recession with chronally event flat procedures. And what they concluded was that connected tissue graft or an anomalic derivative in conjunction with the chronally advanced flap enhances the probability of attaining complete root coverage of Miller class one and two recessions. No other systematic review has come to that conclusion. So, so that's that's a pretty big change. All the other systematic reviews say that, that adding anything else to connected tissue graft uh, uh, didn't seem to make a difference. So, I, for those two reasons, I think you're going to see a resurgence, more interest, more papers coming out uh, using an animal matrix derivative. Well, what happens if, what if we use the cells I showed you and we use biologic mediators to try to direct the cells into the activity we want? That kind of makes sense. Well, we were part of a small animal study that uh, David Cochran's group in San Antonio did in which we used the, the uh, uh, living human fibroblast-derived dermal substitute along with enamel matrix derivative. It was a, a baboon study. Uh, surgical defects were created. And we had class three frications, randomized to receive an open flap derivative, now we made derivative, or the human fiber relaxed derived dermal substitute, or a combination of the two. And we looked at it six months uh, uh, later. So here is the, the defect uh, 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 following the healing. And you can see there's ligature here just to make sure there's no spontaneous healing. You can see that the baboon's not doing a great job with daily home care. And Anytime you're looking at animal studies and the, the, where they're creating frications, you want to make sure that they don't leave the, the bone in approximately. And, and here, obviously, that wasn't done. And so this is just writing the defects. Now the enamel matrix derivative is being placed into here. 
uh, placing a little more MD here. And now we're going to enfold this living human fibroblast derived dermal substitute into the, the furcation. So it's just kind of been enfolded in there. And now we'll place another sheet on the outside like you would with a traditional guided tissue regeneration membrane. Now on the tooth next to it, if you look closely, you can see we've enfolded the cells into that furcation, but we're not going to place MD here. This will be just the cells. And now we place another layer here. And then the tissue is currently advanced. And here's what we have with control. Here's our notch at the osseous crest. And control is just, just healing, no regeneration whatsoever. Here are the notches down here. Here's the human fibroblast derived dermal substitute. You can see improved regeneration into the furcation as uh, compared to control. And here's the combination of the MD and the human fibroblast derived dermal substitute. In this one, we don't have any epithelium and have more regeneration of the furcation. There were a number of problems with this study. A lot of the, the, the there were some technical problems with the uh, histology, and really you, you couldn't really say much as far as results. I put it in here just again because I think that this is something that we're going to be seeing more of. We're going to see using placing cells, but directing them into to specific activities that, that we're looking for. I want to end with. Staying on the biologically active mediator side, end of the, the tissue engineering matrix. But I want to talk about using platelet derived growth factor and uh, uh, beta TCP. Now, we did a pilot study that uh, you may have read in the International Journal of Parent Restorative Dentistry in 2006, comparing using the PDGF and the TCP compared to connected tissue graft. Uh, in a small study, uh, we were looking at our, our primary FT uh, variable was absolute change in recession depth. And we also looked at clinical attachment level, broken pocket depth, amount of keratinized tissue, and all the, the normal things you would look at. Uh, when we, we evaluated these at baseline three and six months, there were no differences in any of these parameters at baseline. And when we looked at them at six months, uh, uh, we found uh, uh, that uh, uh, there were some positive changes that I'll report on in just a second. Here you, again, get a, a feel for the type of defects that we enrolled into this study. Again, fairly broad, deep recession defects, not small defects. Uh, this will be our control. And uh, here I have a partial thickness flap. Uh, you see I've got my connected tissue over the root surfaces here. I'm going to currently advance the, uh, my flap over the connected tissue. And here a very nice result at three months. Again, we haven't, because this is a study, I haven't gone in and plastic or touched it up or anything like that. You know, a, a very pretty connected tissue graft, 100% root coverage uh, on both of these teeth. This happened to be the, the test tooth. Now here, same patient, opposite side. This will be our, our I'm sorry, that was a control tooth. This is our test tooth, uh, fairly wide, deep uh, recession. Uh, and we will go in, and in this case, we're gonna do not a partial thickness flap, we're gonna do a full thickness flap to about the point where two to three millimeters uh, apical to your osseous crest. Then I go into, into a partial thickness flap. And we go in, we uh, root plane and scale, we'll actually do that prior to, to uh, uh, do it in our flap. Now I'm placing some platelet derived uh, growth factor here on the root surface. And we've hydrated the TCP with the PDGF and we're placing it on the root surface here. But I must have been brain dead at that on that particular day and, and proudly taking pictures of my, my brain deadness in that you can see I placed the TCP right to the CEJ. Obviously you don't want to do that. You, know, you want to leave room for your, your uh, biologic width, so do it as it is in the illustration, not as I show you here. You know, you want, uh, we, we want this just extending a millimeter or so laterally onto the, the bone and we want to leave two or three millimeters from your CEJ uh, to, uh, to the material here. And in the, in the pilot, we were using a, a cell occlusive membrane. Uh, this is the, the membrane and just showing the, the difference in width between it and the, the control connected tissue. At the, by the time we had finished the, test, the, the pilot study, there was data coming out that, you know, you may not want to use a cell occlusive membrane when you're using PDGF. Don't think of, of PDGF as guided tissue regeneration or guided bone regeneration. PDGF needs access to the, the periosteum, to the blood supply, to the cells. And so we now only use membranes if, if, you, if you need to somehow, uh, if it's not a, a self-containing defect. And if you need a membrane, you want something that goes away very quickly. 
So we're using like collagen wound dressings, that kind of thing, not, not cell occlusive uh, membranes. So here is that membrane. I've, I've been hydrated yet with uh, PDGF, and we close the flap. And here is our result at three months. Again, a, an excellent uh, root coverage, very pretty, nice contours, 100% root coverage, no visible signs of inflammation. And if we can pair at six months, they test at the control uh, a very nice uh, uh, end result on, on both uh, connective tissue and the root coverage with uh, the PDGF. And just to throw, show you another uh, uh, of one of the patients in the study, uh, this is connective tissue graft and this is the, the PDGF graft. Again, uh, note the how much more natural that looks. It doesn't have that kind of straight line that you would expect from a connective tissue graft. And our conclusion to the pilot was that both procedures predictably achieved root coverage. And at the end of six months, all patients tested control had no more than one millimeter residual recession. All tissues appeared healthy and stable. And the test graphs appeared less bulky and more aesthetic. And the case theory demonstrates proof of principle that it's possible to treat recession type defects with PDGF and TCP and collagen membrane. And the results support the need of a properly powered clinical study to determine can we really do that. And then we took this then into a larger study. And we use lessons learned, and we change this, our technique a little bit on the, the bigger study. In this study, we are again simply trying to, to uh, compare it to connected tissue graft. And this is a two-part study. We have, we're going to look at, at the, your typical clinical parameters, and we're also going to look at attachment. Because I think as, we, as we're moving in these biologically active mediators, we need to ask ourselves, what is the value added here? Because we know we can cover roots. I can cover it all day long with all sorts of things. But you have to ask yourself, what are these other materials providing that we can't achieve through connective tissue graft? So this study has, we're looking at clinical parameters, but I think very, very importantly, we're also going to look at the type of attachment that we're going to get on the root surface with the PDGF, because we have both light microscopy and micro CT that I'll show you in just a moment. So if we look at the clinical parameters, a 30 patient study, six months, uh, we have, this study is completed, we're, we, we are, are in, the, we, we've already submitted, there's going to be two papers, we've already submitted the paper to the International Journal of Parent Restorative Dentistry, and we're also going to submit the bigger paper to Journal of Periodontology. It should be uh, submitted within a couple of weeks. So we have 30 subjects, uh, six months patients, our primary efficacy parameter was recession depth, and you can see the type of defect that we have here. In this study we decided to mark the CEJ with a pencil. It just makes it easier to see uh, photographically. Secondary efficacy parameters, uh, clinical attachment level, probing depth reduction with the keratinized tissue, percent root coverage, color texture, aesthetic satisfaction, pain and discomfort. Now, when we look to see what is statistically different between the two, these were the only parameters that had any statistical significantly significant differences between the two. Uh, the recession depth, uh, in other words, how much root surface are you covering? And I think a more meaningful, it means the same thing, but a more meaningful thing is percent root coverage, uh, came out in favor of the connective tissue graft. We got almost 99% root coverage with the connective tissue graft to 91% root coverage with the chronally advanced flap and the, uh, the PDGF. Problem is, we're doing so many of these studies, I'm just getting too doggone good with these connective tissue grafts. Because again, think back to what you would expect on the meta-analysis. Systematic reviews would tell you that you should be getting 89% root coverage with connected tissue grafts. So if we're getting 89% root coverage, well, this is looking really good. And again, think back to systematic reviews would tell you with just your chronally advanced flap, you should be, able to be getting about 82% root coverage. So we're, we are way above 82% here with 90%, 91% root coverage. So I think you need to couch that with it. Also, though, if you look at, at uh, percent root coverage and then you look at aesthetic satisfaction, the patient says they're the same. You know, I think this is another area that you're going to see in future studies. We're going to be doing much more composite indexes as our primary efficacy parameter because it is, it is naive of us to think that percent root coverage is, a, is an appropriate surrogate for, for patient satisfaction. Almost all root coverage, even the systematic reviews say that the reason you do root coverage procedures is because of patient desire. Not health, patient desire. So if that's the case, there's a lot of factors that go in here. Why are all of our patients saying that they're equally satisfied? And here one's almost 
you know, 10% different than the other? Well, for one, our patients may not be as anal as we are, but also they're looking at a lot of other things. They're not just looking at the amount of root coverage, they're looking at tissue thickness. Is one more bulky, is one less bulky? They're looking at color, they're looking at texture. They're looking at the, the amount of improvement that they had before, what they had before. So a lot of things go into this. So I think in future studies, you're gonna see less of, of the primary efficacy parameter being recession depth. You're gonna see composite scores that are gonna be more appropriate to what the patient really wants. So that, that was interesting, and we're seeing that more and more. If you look at CalGain, they were identical. If you look at probing depth reduction, it actually favored the PDGF slightly. With the keratinized tissue, same. And pain and discomfort favored the, uh, the test, as you would imagine, because you don't have a, a, a paddle donor site. So if we look at, here is uh, uh, our patient, and I'll show you a little video in a moment of how we, we did this technique. Again, we're in this study marking the CEJ with a pencil, uh, a fairly broad, uh, deep defect, uh, intraoperative measurements. We do a full thickness flap, uh, two or three millimeters beyond the osseous crest. I'm placing the, the PDGF onto the root surface here, and uh, we've, we've, you, you want to make sure you, you've already hydrated your TCP at least 10 minutes prior to placing this on there. And you can see that uh, I learned something from the, the pilot study, that I'm placing the material about two millimeters from the CEJ. You want to leave room for your attachment apparatus here. Uh, uh, and, and also, this is the illustration I showed you from the pilot study, and you can see that we now feel you need far less TCP than what we had initially. You only want enough there to keep that membrane from collapsing onto the root surface. So, uh, you know, probably the fewer particles you can place there uh, just to keep the, the membrane off the root surface is, is what you want. Now, the, the TCP is, is physically uh, uh, filling the defect, is preventing the, the uh, uh, tissue from collapsing in. It, uh, uh, also uh, facilitates uh, the stabilization of the blood clot, but it's just a scaffold. The, the star of the show is, is the PDGF. You know, this is a, a, a purely synthetic cell signaling growth factor. We know more about this particular growth factor than any other growth factor in periodontics. It, it's chemotactic for the PDL and bone cells and, and mitogenic for both, and it's also angiogenic. It stimulates osteoblasts to produce VEGF and all sorts of other things that stimulates angiogenesis, which we've talked about as being important. So in this study, unlike the other one, we didn't use a cell occlusive membrane. We just used a collagen wound dressing. Uh, and so this is gonna go away very quickly. Uh, I'm hydrating it with the, the PDGF as well. And so here it is hydrated. I then close the flap and I place a little more PDGF on the surface because it, like uh, EMD, uh, stimulates uh, uh, wound healing. And so I'm placing that on the tissue to stimulate wound healing. We place our sutures. Now, this is a, uh, uh, not a passive graft. This is an active graft. And the, the PDGF causes the cementoblast to, to migrate into the root surface, begin producing cementum. Osteoblasts are coming in, fibroblasts are moving in, uh, and, and endothelial cells beginning to, to create attachment apparatus over time. Uh, we have cementum uh, being laid down on the root surface. We have our, our uh, osseous crest ex being extended by the production of bone, and we see that we've got a uh, uh, organized in PDL, and finally attachment apparatus. Now, you know, we can all draw these illustrations. I'll show you some histology in just a moment that uh, uh, is real evidence of what's going on here. So here is a, a little video of uh, uh, the procedure itself. First, we're going to, to come in and, and we're going to root plane and scale before we do any sort of uh, flap. And, and I'll use, as you're seeing here, a chisel. I'll also come in with uh, just you know, whatever it takes. You know, I'll, uh, curette, uh, if I need it, I'll, I'll come in with a high speed finishing burn. You know, whatever I need to, to make certain that I have a biologically compatible root surface. Uh, I, I'm not really trying to necessarily bring it into the alveolar housing. I just want to make sure it's nice and clean. Uh, we routinely, you know, we don't do it in the study, but we, we routinely remove class five restorations and you know, are grafting over these previously restored areas. Uh, we're using, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, tetracycline, or as a biomodifier on the root surface just to remove bacterial smear layer and irrigating that with some sterile saline. And now just gonna come in, make uh, two divergent incisions uh, on the mesial and the distal of the defect.
computer is extra slow today. At least it's running. And now we'll do an intracellular incision, just freeing up the papilla areas, and I'll do an intracellular incision. And remember this, we're going to do a full thickness flap, two or three millimeters beyond the uh, osseous crest there. So that's what is coming in with periosteal elevators. Now we have our, our full thickness flap, then I'm going to uh, uh, come in and uh, create a partial thickness uh, dissection. Now we were on a microscope simply to get the video. You don't need a microscope. I don't, I don't use a microscope for anything. Uh, I use surgical loops for everything. Uh, but we were there, you know, I don't want you to leave thinking you need a microscope to do this, you don't. It makes it harder to do it, in fact. So I'm, now I'm just going in, creating our partial thickness flap, freeing it high into the vestibule so I have uh, a very, uh, I, I can currently advance my flap without any tension whatsoever. Uh, I, I will not go in and do any more root planing here. Uh, you want to leave whatever, you know, Sharpies, fibers, and whatever you have on the, the root surface, uh, you don't want to do any more root planing here. So we've previously hydrated our TCP with the, the PDGF. And you can see it handles very easily, just stays right on uh, my instrument there. Now, remember one of our lessons learned from our pilot study is we want to put as little as this as possible. Uh, just want enough to support the membrane so it doesn't collapse over the root surface. So I'm trying to kind of tamp it down so we have maybe just, you know, one, one layer of, of, the, of that rather than, you know, a whole pile of it. And we want it to extend just a millimeter or so onto the bone at all the perimeters of the the, the defect, and we want to keep it away from our CEJ by you know two or three millimeters. I have to say that that it, as we began the pilot study, I was a little concerned. Uh, uh, you know, what's going to happen to this TCP? Is it going to migrate? Is it going to you know perforate my flaps? Is it going to mig migrate out the incision lines? And I have to say that that never happened, and, and it also never happened in the, the uh, this bigger study. Now I'm putting more of the TCP on that. You know, I've already hide, I've put it on the root surface, I've hydrated the TCP, and now I'm putting even more on the surface of that. Now I'm going and we're just taking our collagen wound dressing and uh, cutting the, the amount out that, uh, that we, we need to cover the, the defect. The reason I'm using this uh, uh, was because of, originally I was worried about the, the TCP migrating. Uh, and I thought this might help contain the defect, but also it, it's somewhat of another carrier for the, the PDGF, or you'll see I'll saturate it in a moment, uh, uh, right here with the, the PDGF. So it's going to be another little carrier that will be right next to the soft tissue. I just tacked it in approximately uh, with a, a gut suture. And then we come back and currently, well, I guess now I'm tacking it. Approximately. I also had concerns with this material uh, that, that, you know, can you really suture it? Is it going to tear? You know, and that wasn't a problem at all. It, it holds the suture very nice, the little collagen wound dressing, and, and uh, not an issue whatsoever. But in, you know, intrabony defects, if I don't need a membrane, we're not using them. And placing a little more now that I have the, the membrane sutured down, a little more PDGF. Now we'll probably advance our flap. Like any of these, uh, whether you're using connected tissue or using anything, you want a flap that doesn't have any tension on it, uh, that's going to almost lay there without sutures. You know, when you're elevating the, the lip here to take photographs, you're putting lots of tension on it. but. Uh, you want a tension-free flap that's just going to, to set there. And we're just going to uh, uh, suture it in approximately, and I'll put a couple of sutures to, to close the, the uh, vertical defects here. Not, not the defects, the vertical incisions. Closing the verticals there. Trimming it a little bit since we've currently advanced that wider piece of tissue. 
Just making it fit into the inner proximal. And then once you're sutured, place a little more of the PDGF to stimulate wound healing. And that's our graft. So this is that patient. And here we have at six months, 100% root coverage. And if we compare that to uh, the, the opposite side, this is the PDGF side, this is the connected tissue side. Uh, very similar results with, with both of the graphs. Another patient in that study, uh, very similar type defects. This is the connective tissue. You can see it appears a little thicker, a little flatter compared to the PDGF side. Another, uh, you know, we, we included mandibular defects. Mandibular defects, as you all know, are much more difficult to cover. Uh, you have more muscle tension there, so uh, there's, and also the, these, you know, these are di more difficult to cover. If you, if you have teeth that you have recession on all of these teeth uh, and you're only going to cover one, it's more difficult because you don't have this broad band of tissue on your adjacent teeth. So what I'm saying is both of these are very challenging here. Here we're going to cover this particular uh, first bicuspid so you can see how it looks like at six months and this is what the PDGF. This is our control on the first bicuspid here and this is the connective tissue. Again, both very nice similar results. Another uh, uh, patient here is the PDGF side. This is the connective tissue side. Uh, this has a more natural look than what the connective tissue side provides. Another patient, PDGF on this side, connective tissue on that side. Another uh, mandibular defect. Again, lots of recession on teeth with, with multiple uh, recession. This is our PDGF side, our connective tissue side. And then to end this morning, I want to talk about what happens here at the root surface level? You know, what's happening? What kind of value added do we have? And, and so as part of this study, we were able to, to recruit two patients that needed bicuspid extraction for orthodontics. And that allows us then to be able to go in and evaluate this, not only with light microscopy, but with micro CT. Some of you may not have seen micro CTs before, but this is this unbelievable technology. It really shows you what you're looking at. Now, if I keep talking about systematic reviews, and if you if you go back to systematic reviews, systematic reviews say that connected tissue grafts will predictably restore the protective functional morphology of the mucogenital complex. Connected tissue grafts will predictably create the re recreation of aesthetic balance between marginal tissues and, and adjacent tooth roots and crowns. But we haven't found anything that's going to predictably do number three. <coughs> Excuse me, regeneration of the lost attachment apparatus, including formation of new cementum with inserting connective tissue fibers and supporting alveolar bone. In the study, we had six teeth. Two were randomized to receive connective tissue graft. Four were randomized to receive the PDGF. We, we achieved 100% root coverage on all six teeth. But we, we achieved regeneration in four of four of the defects with the PDGF. We achieved regeneration in none of the defects with connective tissue grafts. And the one thing that I'm so proud about with this study is that so many of these, these histologic studies that you and I see, it's one of these things that, that you almost have to take it by the reputation of the speaker or the author, and you kind of say, well, if you kind of squint like this and you look like this, you can maybe see that's what's happening here. There is no doubt about what I'm about to show you. Dr. Uh, Professor Shupak did the histology on this, and, and this guy is a genius and an artist. So this is our, our, uh, our, our, our treatment plan. We have at day zero, we're going to surgically create these defects because, again, these are bicuspids that are going to be extracted for orthodontic purposes. Both are adults. And, and so here is a bicuspid that will be extracted. So at day zero, I, I do a full thickness flap. I have to remove enough bone here so that when I, I want to end up with a three millimeter defect or more. So I know I want my bone to be at least two to three millimeters beyond that. So I'm going to rem remove enough bone so that I have, my, uh, I have enough uh, room for the bio biologic width when I apically reposition my uh, tissue. So this is what it looks like at a month after I have recreated uh, or after I've created the, the defect. 
Now, we left them, though, for two months just exposed so they became chronic, you know, so that we have all the, the normal stuff that goes on in the mouth, you know, the root surfaces are becoming chronic and exposed to the oral environment. So at two months, we, we randomized these to receive either connective tissue graft or the PDGF and, and the TCP. So we went in at two months. I made a histologic marker uh, at the free gingival margin and I made one at the osseous crest. That's what these are. And then we either treated it with connected tissue or the PDGF and we coronally advanced our flap. And this is at a month after we have uh, uh, performed our surgery. And then at 11 months, we did block sections. So we, we left these for nine months to heal before we went in and did our blocks. And after when we did our blocks, we, uh, we, we grafted that with metallized free stride bone and, and PDGF. And then the patients, you know, go into orthodontic therapy. The, the areas where we took the teeth out are closed. So it's a nice model that, that's ethical and, uh, you know, passes all of our IRB requirements. Uh, and these patients then uh, uh, were able to, to receive orthodontics that they wouldn't have been able to afford otherwise. So it's a nice model to be able to look at what's going on in these root surfaces. So I've got six teeth to share with you, and I'll, I'll show each one of them. Here we have uh, uh, our patient uh, uh, G, and, and this is uh, the defect at uh, uh, two months, or what, prior, prior to the, yes, the two months when we're going to do our graft. So this is our marker I made at the free gingival margin. This is the marker at the uh, original alveolar crest. This is nine months later. So you can see we covered all that. It looks very good. This happens to be the, the PDGF graft, so a nice aesthetic look to our PDGF graft. We remove this tooth in block. And what we have here, this is the micro CT of the root surface, uh, or, the, or the tooth after we moved it. Now, what you're looking at here, this is the bone that's growing down over the root surface. You can't see this notch because it's way up here. This notch is that notch. That's the CEJ. You see that we covered down the CEJ. But look at the bone that's crawling down over that root surface. And when we do a transverse section through that, here is the notch at the alveolar crest. Okay? That's the histologic marker here, here. Look at how much bone's growing down over that root surface. Here is, is this notch. Our bone's growing down virtually all the way to that point. And if we compare that to the light microscopy, we can see what's going on. Here, and I'll show you higher power in a moment. But again, look how, how you know, this looks just like that. Now, this isn't bone that, that's kind of growing out in a finger. You know, you're taking a slice of that through the middle. And so what you're looking at, this is, this is like your, your lamina dura on, if you're on a radiograph here. And we have complete root coverage. Here's your CEJ. So we've got root coverage beyond the CEJ. Uh, we, our long junctional epithelium ends right here at the uh, uh, coronal portion of the, the notch at the original uh, free gingival margin. But look at how the bone's growing way down there. And as we get to more high power, uh, we see that, that as we have this kind of finger of bone reaching out here, here we have some residual TCP particles. We also have some inflammation around this. Now, TCP should not be here at this time. TCP, TCP should have been dissolved and gone. And, and so it appears, as robust as this is, that this residual TCP may be interfering with, e e as good as this is, it would be even better had this TCP uh, resorbed as it was supposed to. But again, look at, the, at what's going on with the micro CT. This is all the new bone. This is some of the residual TCP particles. This is our notch of the osseous crest. Look at how much bone has grown down over that root surface below that notch of the osseous crest. And uh, that's exactly what we're seeing on the light microscopy. We have the, all of the, the normal uh, uh, type of bone growth you would expect here. We've got our lamellar bone, our osteon. We've got cementum that's grown across the, the notch here. We've got woven bone here. So it's, it's going through the normal cascade of bone growth as it's growing down over the root surface. Another pa oh, This is the same patient, another tooth with the, the uh, uh, PDGF. Here I'm marking at the... Uh, uh, free gingival margin here with a, uh, a little finishing burr. That's what this is. Now I've laid my flap. I've marked at the alveolar crest. Here is at nine months, 100% root coverage. 
We remove the tooth and block. And again, look at the micro CT, look at the bone growing down over the root surface. I mean, this is just unbelievable that you're seeing how much bone is growing down over the root surface. This is our notch here, this little dimple right there is the notch of the, of the original free gingival margin. You can't see this notch because it's covered by, by the bone. And if we look at a transverse section, again, very interesting. This is the, this is the notch at the original alveolar crest. Look at the, the very uniform space we have for the PDL here. Everybody understand what we should be seeing? We should, the bone should end here. That's where it was. But what you're looking at here is the bone extending two, three millimeters beyond that with a nice normal dimension for your PDL as we cut transversely through that. And if we look at it through uh, on light microscopy, Again, look at the finger of bone that's grown down over this here. Look at the old bone here, old bone. All of this is new bone, stretching down over the root surface. But also as I looked at that, I said, you know, that looks just like that last one here. Looks like this wave kind of cresting over and you have this, this lump of TCP here that what if I didn't have that, you know, would we continue to, to see this bone as, as wonderful as this is, how much better would it be had that TCP resorbed. And if we look at this in more high power, again, this, this is the part of the histology I'm saying, there's no doubt here about what's going on. I mean, look at the old bone. Look at the demarcation of the new bone here. All of this is new bone. We have, this, this is your dentin. This is, is all new cellular cementum. Here's your old cementum. This is new cellular cementum, all new woven bone, this isn't an island of new bone, this is new bone. Again, you're looking at this has been cut through, so this is part of it. But this is all new bone here. And if we look at this area even more blown up, here are our, our osteocytes here, uh, woven bone. We've got our Sharpies fibers coming in here, and I'll show you some even more high power to that a moment ago. All of this is new cellular cementum, Sharpies fibers, old cementum, dent. Look at this polarized here. Here's your dentin, your old cementum, new cellular cementum laying on your old cementum, your, your inserting collagen fibers, your Sharpies fibers, functionally oriented PDL, PDL, this is all new bone. Look at the Sharpies fibers coming into here. Amazing. Another patient that, was, that has a PDGF, again our two markers, Nine months, 100% root coverage, tooth taken out in block. Micro CT, here is our original, our notch at the original gingival margin. You can't see this notch because again, the bone's growing up over the root surface. You're seeing with the micro CT there, our CEJs. Here we have our, our notch at the original gingival margin. Our lung junctional epithelium ends here. But I wanted you to look at the regenerated osseous crest. It's almost to the original gingival margin. An amazing amount of bone growth growing up over that root surface here. And again, there's no, you don't have to squint. I mean, there's no doubt what we've got going on here. Here's our dentin, here's our old cementum, new cellular cementum laying over the old cementum, functionally oriented PDL, new bone, Sharpie's fibers inserting into both, all, almost all the way to the original gingival notch. Different patient with the, the PDGF two different uh, histologic markers, two removed in block. Didn't get quite as much bone growth here, uh, but we still got bone growth beyond the, uh, uh, the, the notch of the original osseous crest. You see it extending down here. But again, look at the, the polarized uh, microscopy. Here we've got new bone. Look at that functionally oriented PDL, our new cementum. Look at the Sharpies fibers coming into here. I mean, you're not gonna probe into that case. That's unbelievable, the Sharpies fibers here. New cementum, PDL, new bone. Look at the Sharpies fibers coming into here. Cementoblast, cementoid, new cementum. And I'll sh show you two controls so you can compare now. Here is connected tissue graft on uh, the first patient with our, our histologic markers here, tooth removed in block, and the micro CT. For the first time, you're seeing the notch now at the original alveolar crest here. You didn't see that in any of the others because the bone grew up over it. And we see that, that we've got our long junctional epithelium that's running all the way down here to the uh, original osseous crest. 
we have parallel connected tissue fibers, and look what happens if we look at the micro CT and you know, we turn it around. It, the root surface is just completely denuded. It looks exactly like it looked the day we did it. Kind of makes, when I first saw this, it made me rethink. Remember the old studies in osteosurgery, you're supposed to lose bone when you flap it? Well, if we lost it, it remodeled because it looks exactly like it looked when we went in there that day. And we can see again in more high power the long junction epithelium extending to the osseous crest and, and no new cementum, no regeneration whatsoever. And the final uh, control on the, the control of the other patient, the last one, and again, this is the notch at the alveolar crest, the notch at the uh, original free gingival margin. Absolutely no regeneration, no bone whatsoever. We see, uh, in this case, we actually get some root resorption. And you know, there are a few reports in the literature about root resorption after connective tissue grafts. This was asymptomatic. I wouldn't have known about it had we not had the, uh, the histology. But you see you have parallel connective tissue fibers running along the root surface, long junctal epithelium. You have some reparative cementum here. So although connective tissue graft is the most predictable technique for root coverage, there's still a number of limitations. We've got a remote harvest site, a limited amount of donor tissue. We have increased morbidity and a questionable potential for regeneration. And this study then is, is indicating that with the PDGF and the chronic advanced flap, it offers an effective treatment of gingival recession defects, including the regeneration of the three tissues that we need for uh, uh, the attachment apparatus. You know, again, you can draw these illustrations all day long, but it's this type of demonstration that shows really what's going on here. Do you really get new cementum, new bone, new functionally oriented parent fibers? Look at it. All old bone. Look at this new bone running up the root surface. Look at the new cementum on the root surface. Look at the functionally oriented PDL, Sharpie's fibers. No doubt about what we're getting here. And I think it, it speaks so much to what's going on. If you just look at the micro CTs, look at all the activity on the root surface on our teeth that have the, the PDGF. All the bone growing up over the root surfaces. Look at the root surfaces on the, the teeth that we did our connective tissue crest. They look dead. It's just sitting there just like we, we left it. So clearly something going on here as far as regeneration. And the, I'll leave you with just an interesting little uh, uh, case. Remember this one that I showed you in our pilot study? This particular tooth. This guy came into my office uh, three years later and he had a periodontal abscess on a molar in this same quadrant. This is that tooth three years later. And you can see three years later, we still are, have some nice root coverage. We might have a little recession there, but it looks still real good. Well, I got permission. Well, can I take a peek there? You know, since I'm going to be, you'll be numb, and can I just kind of open the tissue and see what we've got? And here at three years later, you see we have three millimeters of bone growth over that root surface compared to what we had when we went in initially, which was very much what we're seeing in our micro CT analysis on our. Uh, our, our study. So uh, uh, we, through our soft tissue engineering, are being able to demonstrate using live cell technology, increased keratinized tissue. We've been at least proof of principle of augmenting papilla, improving our abilities to cover denuded root surfaces, lots of, of ways to stimulate wound healing. Uh, we're showing true regeneration and we're being able to do it with all of these things, less morbidity, increased predictability, and I think that the future is, is unbelievable. You know, there has never, ever been a t better time to be a periodontist or to be, you know, a patient in needs of our, need of our services. So you've been a, a great audience, especially for the, the last morning of our uh, meeting, and I'm appreciative that, that you're all here. Thank you very much. Mike. Mike, thank you very much for a simply outstanding presentation today. Um, we'll bring the lights up. Actually, we're a little bit over. I want to get people to lunch in order to um, nine. That concludes this program. This material was recorded and produced by Mobile Tape Company Incorporated of Valencia, California. More information about other available media may be obtained by calling 1-800-369-5718 or 1-800-369-5718.